Hi again, I'm Alisa. I'm co-founder of Hydro Technologies. What we're doing is we're making images measurable and building AI and machine learning tool to help companies to post the right images on social media to reach their audience. But that's not what I'm going to talk today. Um, about what I'm going to talk about is traction, why it matters. I'm going to be, give a brief introduction to the topic and some takeaways which we with Tidy have found to now. So basically what you learned. About myself, I am originally a technical person who started with computer science. I've done some machine learning, computer vision, data. I have found out that DevOps is really fascinating. It's where you have got lots of machines, lots of service in the cloud. And you want to do something, and what I did is I worked at Starlight for a while. It's a startup from Munich. Very cool. Um, afterwards, I was doing data engineering. I was doing consulting with international clients, kind of combining my data and server stuff. And currently, I'm co-founding in Pilot Technologies. I'm the CAO, basically Chief Analytics Officer. So I try to do as much data stuff as possible. But in reality, I drifted into doing stuff with the team, so hiring people. Um, making sure that we as a team work together, which is a very interesting topic, and of course marketing. And eventually we realized that we really need traction. So we got funding, we had, had like secured um, some grants from the EU and Germany, like the Access stipend. Uh, we got accepted into the Access Framework Plan and Play Accelerator, so on this side everything was good. Uh, but getting customers and getting users always was kind of an afterthought for us. So we were, were working on you know, producing the most amazing technology we can and pitching it and trying to work our way towards even more investment. But we weren't conscious about getting new users and new clients. So we realized that we really need traction and we realized that it's a bit too late. And I myself realized that marketing is really amazing. Like it's such an awesome power to be able to help people to find what they really need. So I shifted even more into traction and growth hacking. And this is why I'm here. So the reason for this talk is that I myself wish I would have learned about this when we started out months ago. And um, you know, the dilemma you have here is what any technical person experiences. You build something, and it's, it's nice, like you got success, it's easy, it's what you're comfortable with. And then you're like, okay, so I built it, now I can spread the word. And it's usually way too late. So you go to Reddit, you like post it to your peers, and they know about it, and they care, nobody else, and it's just sad. And it's preventable, because you can do something about it. Even sadder is if you are a technical or non-marketing-minded founder, and you do the same with your startup. You ship something, and you may have validated the idea, but then it's there, and what do you do? So, eventually, I got to read the Traction book, which is kind of popular among VCs, bootstrapping people, startup people. And it starts out, the description of it starts out with, most startups don't fail at building a product, most startups fail at getting traction. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. What's Traction? I don't want to give this definition, I just want to give some quotes. So basically, traction is a sign that something is working. It's a quantitative evidence of customer demand. So you're doing something and you see that people care. And of course, it's moving growth curve up and to the right, basically having something which works. And the reasons why you want traction, of course, like more users, more customers, more money. But also, it reduces the risks your startup has or your project has by making technical marketing and team stuff easier. And of course, VCs will ask you for traction. So fundraising becomes easier, hiring, partnerships, acquisitions, all of this good stuff. It is not enough to build a great product. You have to put effort and conscious thought into how you market it. You have to have traction. You have to work on traction. That's the book. I really, really recommend <coughs> anybody who's interested in it reads it. And at the core of the book, basically, are a few insights. The whole approach, like how it was written and what it tells people to do, is based on structured research and experience. So there's lots of interviews from, from founders. Uh, examples and anecdotes, like when I was reading the book, I just had a spreadsheet open and for each chapter I noted down multiple ideas, which we afterwards went to implement for the test. And everything is very actionable, which is nice. 
And one part of the book is the 50% rule. Basically, of course, you're building a great product, but it says that 50% of your time as well as a founder should be spent on traction. This is not quite practical, to be, to be honest, because you have to do hiring as well. So, like, 50% apart from hiring is trash. Um, and what you want, really, even if, if you do some uh, lean product development, is you want a steady stream of cold customers, of people who have not been in contact with you before, so you can continue, continue to see that you're on the right path. And a um, network that they're using is one of a leaky bucket. So in the beginning, you've got a product which is kind of a bucket with holes in it. Like You get some users in it, people go out, and then you see where the holes are, and you can start fixing those holes. You can start making your product better. You can start being able to pour more water in the bucket. These are the authors. It's Gabriel and Justin. Gabriel is the founder of BackTapGo. And Justin has been around a while, for a while as well. He's found an exception among others. And they've been doing the research, they've been doing interviews. So my takeaways from the book before we dive into details is it's important to be conscious about the significance of traction and the effort which you put into it. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It's very nice to have a structured approach to measure, optimize, and to have focus. But more about this later. Um, there's a few terms and concepts which the book introduces, and I would like to go into each of them in some detail. First of all, there's moving the needle, which is basically you want to do stuff which makes a difference for you. If you're starting out, you want to get 10 customers, or 10 users at least. Then if you've got enough, you want to get your first, first paying user, first paying customer, and so on. Uh, you better have a strategy, you better put some effort into testing, and you set a goal and you stay on a critical path towards the goal, which means that you don't diverge too much. Uh, the bullseye method is quite fascinating. And then, of course, the main part of the book are traction channels, which basically describes different ways in which you can get customers into your product. So, in detail, moving the needle. Um, a big part of the book is about setting goals in numbers. And you can consider the needle to be moved if you are actually moving towards these numbers, if you are moving towards your goals. Um, and there's like three phases described of moving the needle. Yeah, you can be in the beginning, where you want to make something which people actually want. Then if you have got um, product market fit, you want to do something, you want to market something people want, and afterwards you want to scale the business. And in each of these phases, there's something which will move the needle for you. You should focus on this one. Critical path, as I said, you define a goal, and then you choose a path with the fewest numbers of steps towards that goal, and you try not to diverge. Um, you plan ahead, of course. You don't only have this grand goal, but you also see, you know, to go there, I need this feature, and then I need to do this marketing stuff, and I need to do this to finally reach it. And the goals can be, for example, um, getting funding or being profitable. And I think the Hardest thing about the critical path is saying no to stuff. Like, except especially when we were in the accelerator, we got lots of opportunities. Like every single week, every two days or so, somebody came up to us, some person from a big company, or maybe somebody our, our portfolio manager wanted to introduce us to. And sometimes it was really hard to say, you know, this sounds really interesting, but this is not what we're, we're building. In hindsight, it got easier, and it was a good thing to say no. One concept of the book is the goals and methods. It basically is a structured way of going towards choosing what you want to focus on. Focus is very important. So in the beginning, you've got all of these possible traction channels, which you can use. And you just don't exclude anything. You brainstorm something for every one of them. Afterwards, you choose three, where you actually test your assumptions and try to see if they work for you. Uh, the hard thing is that you can't tell in advance what will work best for your company or what will work best for your product, but eventually you find out, and then you focus on this one thing which will move the needle for you. So it's like a bullseye kind of circle arrangement of things. And the most extensive parts of the book are, of course, the 19 traction channels. Like, they're calling traction channels actually as customer acquisition channels, or if 
you're into marketing more, it's, it can be considered to be marketing and distribution channels. And funny thing, each of those 19 channels has worked for a company in some stage. And I think the book states it over and over, uh, please don't dismiss any channel as irrelevant from the get-go. Just consider everything, try to brainstorm, and maybe even try to focus on something which is not usual for your industry. Like the best channels are sometimes underutilized ones, something where people are not. So, um, I would like to make this a bit interactive, if you'd like. So I just, I'll just go through 19 channels, say something to each of them, and if you feel like you've got a story to contribute, or maybe if something, something which has worked for your company, or some of your projects, please feel free. Do you need a flip chart? <laughs> uh, no, 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 thanks. Okay. No, thanks. Just, <laughs> I'm actually not expecting anybody to say anything, but, you know, just offer <laughs> <laughs> And my goal here is, um, a bit to give you inspiration, to make you think about something and maybe note something down afterwards, try it for the stuff you're working on. This has been my, take, my main takeaway from the book, just considering everything, even if I didn't think this would be something which is relevant to us. All right, so first of all, it starts easy, targeting blocks. Basically, you want to go out and you want to get in touch with people who have got authority in your small niche, somebody your audience already listens to, and you know, negotiate. So maybe you want you want to publish a guest blog post. Maybe you want them to try your tool and write about it. Maybe you want them to um, distribute coupons or discounts for the tool afterwards, so they can pass it on to their audience. And it has worked um, for Code Academy or Reddit, for example. They've grown their communities around being in touch with blogs. First of all, the fun thing, uh, Mint. They have started with blogging, so the founder has started before there was a product, and they had an audience of forty thousand customers before launching which is quite, quite impressive, I think. Um, the second one is more classically, you know, publicity. You reach out to newspapers or TV shows. Um, depending on what company it is, it might work. For example, um, a company from Aachen, I know they are producing kind of a shoe, which can be, you know, it's, it's a lady's shoe where you can, like, flip out the heel or tuck it in if you, if you need to go fast. And they had <laughs> much success going on a local TV station and just advertising <clears throat> Unconventional PR is my favorite right now. It's um, usually considered to be a publicity stunt. Once again, Reddit, Hitmonk have done it. Uh, Reddit, they've just you know, sent up, out t-shirts to their users with the Reddit alien, and they were delighted. They like made photos of it, posted it on social media. It will help them grow. Um, but you don't need to do something as special. You just, you know, if you just go above and beyond for your customers, if you just offer terrific customer service, if you, you know, do something nice for them, like send a handwritten note on some occasion, this might be considered to be unconventional PR because this makes them talk about you and spread the word. Can I ask you a question? Though? Yes, please. For example, because, for example, I had an experience where I bought something and this thing just, after one week, didn't work any longer. I put up with the customer support and they were just amazing. And they replied, they reply immediately and they change it within a week. And there was back and forth with a couple of emails, and then in the end, just as a suggestion, we say, "Would you like to uh, to post uh, your experience?" Nice. And to me, it was totally clear that I would do that with pleasure because I was really, really happy with that. Yeah. Do you mean this kind of stuff? Uh, yes, yes. Um, this I think definitely qualifies. Sometimes it's in between some channels. And these channels came out of interviews, so they just talked to lots of founders, and afterwards said, "You know." I think we saw 19. Let's do 19. Uh, yes, it sounds like something which, which does good. Yes? I just had this with uh, Airbnb. Yeah. Uh, I set up an account, wanted to rent an apartment, and I had to upload a picture. And uh, for some reason, I don't know, Amazon Web Service had a problem and I couldn't upload a picture. So I went to customer support on the website and said I can't upload a picture. Um, eventually, the next morning, I could upload the picture and even the next time, I didn't check my mailbox for two days, and I just checked my mailbox, and I had about ten emails from Airbnb about is everything all right? Is it working now? And I thought, bloody hell, I'm just a <laughs> random user. I'm still alive. But they they, they seem to have uh, some of their users that are closely working together with Airbnb, and you, there seems to be a way to earn credits if you 
act as their customer service. I don't know. It, it seemed like oh. some some of the emails I got looked like from people that actually just are, are users on Airbnb. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I remember a company. I forgot which one it was. Like one of their trademarks was to have customer service without a script, so everybody was as authentic and as human as possible. This sounds like they were overdoing it. This might be the same direction. Interesting. I didn't know. <laughs> I don't know much about Airbnb, to be honest. But thanks. So. Yeah. Um. All right. That's it. Then there's the bottom list. Search engine marketing. It's when you go on Google, you search for something, and then you get ads which are relevant to what you're currently looking for. Everybody's doing it. Um, <coughs> It's very close to SEO, of course, and the example is Archives. Archives is a um, company who has been have been offering ancestry research, as far as I remember. And of course, like when somebody looks for some town and some name, they want to pop up. Like, they want to offer the result because maybe somebody's interested in finding the ancestors. Um, it worked very well. They were acquired for a huge chunk of money, and this made them grow apparently. Very close, but not quite. Social and display ads. So. Instead of being actively on the search for some term or some topic with SEM, uh, with social and display ads, you just are browsing the internet and stuff shows up which you have not been looking for. Maybe it's interesting, maybe not. Uh, you can advertise on Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. Most companies are also doing this. Um, few are doing it very well, in my opinion. Offline ads. Now, this is an interesting story, I think. You know uh, DuckDuckGo? It's a search engine, and they are advertising that they respect your privacy. And you know, of all the ways in which I would think about advertising a search engine, offline ads would be the last one. Uh, apparently, the founder went out, and he bought a billboard close to the place where Google is located in Silicon Valley. Like, there's lots of technical people going back and forth, and they were like, you know, there's that that go. We're a search engine. We don't track you. <laughs> and this this has made made a push for them. Um, but offline ads, of course, TV, sports, radio, billboard. If you've got a sponsorship for a podcast or something like this, also offline ads, great stuff. Or if you're sponsoring a meetup, like when you've got a meetup, you've got pizza, it all qualifies. Um, SEO, reboard stuff, uh, search engine optimization. You make it easy for people to find you on the internet if you want to do it organic. It's pretty close to content. Uh, it can be helped out by SEM. And Moss is a big company who are doing SEO. So they're pretty good at it. The second girl. Content marketing is when you was well, closely linked to SEO, as I said before. Basically, the goal is to produce something which people will share, something which really brings value. And there's lots of great examples, but I must admit that OkCupid is my favorite one. They are publishing articles which analyze the data they have and give like actionable hints for people who are in the dating scene where they're looking to match with the right person. And they're like saying, hey, so you want to do a, make a good photo? This is what device you should use, and this is what works usually. And they're just pages of pages of pages of stuff. And it's utterly fascinating. And afterwards, people talk about it, people mention it. And if you're doing content marketing right, you're producing evergreen content. So you're writing something once, and then it just continues to draw traffic and to be valuable to people. Email marketing is um, basically everywhere, and it's so bloody efficient, you don't believe it. Um, it can be used in many stages of a customer relationship. So basically, if you've got somebody who's interested, they go, go on your blog and you're like, do you want to download a PDF file of this blog? And they're like, yes, of course. And they don't buy from you, but this kind of starts a relationship. You can start to build trust, you can, can start to like, 